clock right now, but we are waiting for our chair. So we're gonna give him just a few more moments. Been a ditch someplace. Um, I did do things at the end of the start. Our packet our staff is always a little different this time. Um, so what we're doing is we're trying to get them off the packet plan so we can go through all of these and we will 
and that you don't have to be identified with the account card because it's just if you want to follow this. This is for the variance, this is for the city, and you can go ahead and get that for the account. Any questions? Lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Call the call the meeting to order the City of Nisswa Planning Commission Board of Adjustment from Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023. Um, meeting roll call. Jesse Zahn. Gary Harris. John Taylor. Sean Weldon. Dave Reese. Bethany Soderland. Okay. Um, there were no on site visits uh, for tonight's meeting. Uh, are there any additions or deletions to the uh, to the agenda? No. We require approval of the agenda. No. Okay. Move on. Uh, approval of minutes, December sixth, twenty twenty two, Planning Commission uh, meeting. Uh, could I have a uh, motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second on tape, Mr. Taylor. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Is there time at the meeting for the open forum? Is there anybody in the audience that would uh, has something that they would like to bring up that is not on the agenda tonight? Okay. Like a have a motion to open the public hearings, please. A motion to open the hearings. Oh, second. A second. No. All in favor? Aye. 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 First item is a variance application number zero zero one dash two three to allow for the construction of an accessory structure exceeding two hundred square feet in the central business, the CB zoning district. Subject property is located at 25188 Hazelwood Drive, uh, PID number 28110594, owner applicant Gary Kent Hilton. Is the, would you please step up to the, either the desk or the podium? If there's, yeah, it's fine. Do you uh, identify yourself, name? You could turn the microphone off. Gary Kent Hilton. Okay. And this is my tenant, Lenny Haberman. Okay. Um, would you um, care to give us a little quick rundown of what uh, what this is about? Basically, they. Oh. Right. Did you want me to read in the staff report? Yeah, go ahead. Want? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. All right, the applicant is requesting a variance from section 20-181 of the Nisswa Code of Ordinances to construct an accessory structure exceeding 200 square feet in the central business district. Um, they are also seeking a conditional use permit for the construction of a 36 by 56 uh, commercial accessory structure for cold storage. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, the tenant, the garage door store has run out of space and they need additional space, which I have plenty of. And we picked a spot that um, 15 years ago when I bought the property, my original conditional use permit required me to plant a bunch of trees. There were five gallon pots that are now about 20 feet tall, which is going to block more or less the building. Also, help any road noise going towards uh, Lakeshore properties. And it's basically, it's gonna be cold storage only, so there'll be no water or sewer or anything, just uh, electricity for lights. Yeah. Um, the findings of fact is the list that you passed out. Are we to go through each one of these items individually? Or? Those are the items that we need to consider, especially for the variance, just to make sure that um, that we are meeting the criteria for granting a variance. One of the items that uh, need to be considered, uh, number one, is the 
Is the variance in harmony with the purpose and intent of the ordinance? And I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Um, these are questions that you can go ahead and answer if you'd like. Um, I, I wouldn't know how to answer that. <laughs> no. Sorry. This is a commercial use building in, located in a commercial district. Right. Um, the fact that we have ordinance restrictions that um, only allow 200 square feet or less of an accessory structure. Um, in this instance, um, they feel that is quite restrictive and they are seeking that variance so that they are able to do that on this property. The proposed project does meet all setbacks. I don't think that I have any questions myself. Starting to become a pretty well traveled uh, piece of Hazelwood, Coronel Thorpe, right? Coronel yes. Thorpe Road, all the way to 371 now. So I've always and wondered I, when I, it's going to finally get. I questioned you about the 200 square feet, and I didn't realize that the zoning is the same as downtown Main Street, where you, there wouldn't be room to put anything bigger than that. Yeah. Obviously, I have the space, and we're taking into consideration a really nice oak tree to put it where it won't. Uh, obstruct or hurt the uh, the nicest tree on the property, basically. Yeah. John, I don't have anything more. Gary, excuse me. I don't have anything, I don't have anything more. No questions. Um, I, I was, uh, I went out and looked at the site a couple of days ago and it's a nice large piece of property. It's, it's buffered back from from the residential areas, it's highway business, you know, it's central business right there in, in town. Um, and the location that you're proposed to, for the proposed location for the building, I think is, is a good spot. And it looks like it was made for that, that particular piece of land there. We originally tried someplace else and it, it wasn't gonna work and I didn't wanna lose that oak tree. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that you like the spot. So that's, that's what we came up with, it made sense. Okay. I've got, I had one, I've got one question to bring up. Um, the, um, you know, we're, we're going to approve a variance and a conditional use permit in order to put this building in because it doesn't match the ordinance per se. Um, there's also other things that impact our, our businesses in town. And one of them is signage. And um, I'm not being critical, but your, the sign that exists there for that business is is a, is really jumps out. It's, it looks to me like it's considerably more than what the ordinance calls for, even the, the proposed ordinance or the old one for signage. I'd be happy to look into that. Yeah, because yeah, it's 32 square feet, I believe. It's on the one side. It's, but that the building that the sign that faces the highway to me is just kind of it seems like it could be changed to give to reflect the city of city of Nisswa's uh, mystique. Okay, you know, the, that would be something. And, and I would again. agree with that. I mean, I so I just took over as branch manager about two months ago, beginning of October. And that's one of the things that that sign has never sat well with me either. It's something that I want to address in the future. So. Okay, great. Yeah, okay. it's. I mean, it looks more like a temporary banner. You yeah, I, I realize it sounds like I'm nickel and diming it, but that's, yeah. But every time I go through that intersection, my eyes just get focused right. on your sign, and it yeah. just. So it's I know that it doesn't meet to. the ordinances. So. <laughs> I will look into it. I do know that the uh, permanent sign permit was issued in 2020, so I'll mm -hmm. take a look at the uh, provisions of that and. Let you know. Also, I'd like to say that the, the new building is going to be the exact same color with the wings coating. Right, everything. right. So it matches and yeah. looks like it was supposed to be there. I have a question actually not relevant to this application, but is this business, is it still owned by API Group? It is. Yeah. Not Lee? Correct. It's owned by API Group. Understood. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody from the uh, audience have anything to say? Please step up and step up and identify yourself, please, just for the record. I know. Hi. Hi. Say your name and I, address, please. Yes, Thank Bonnie you. Mork, and I'm right across the street, two five one five three Hazelwood Drive. I uh, my I only had a question. And the question was, we know the dimensions of the building. What's the height? 
Uh, is it a two story? No, well, it's 14 feet to the plate. So the total. Yeah. Oh, that's. I, and then it's got a regular and, and gable. gable roof. Okay. So it's a little shorter than the existing building, which is okay. 16 feet. Okay. Yeah. And then let's see, that picture went away there. Um, the first picture oh. of the I'll plot. Yep. The plot. Okay. Where where would it that be? It, it's gonna be right here. See this? Right. See okay. this big oak tree right here? Yep. So we're gonna put it right here. Oh, okay. And that that's all these trees and these trees and what and then a lot of stay. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have my questions answered. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else from the audience? Yes. Don Mark, uh, 25153 Hazelwood, basically right across the street. Uh, is this a stick bit? <laughs> Stick built building or a steel building? Uh, well, a lot of steel outside, just like the existing building. Okay. The stick built. All right. Oh, when you say steel, you mean the frame? Yeah. No, it's pulp wood. Pulp, pulp, basically pulp, pulp wood. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, With the concrete floor. I guess I would actually find myself uh, supporting this proposal because. The city doesn't seem interested in stopping the semis from Jake breaking all all in, coming into that stoplight, which is more than a little irritating across the street. And I think this building would do some to deflect some of that sound. That's kind of what we got there. So I hope. Thank you. Anybody else from the audience have anything to say? Okay, anybody and uh, other comments from the commission? Engineer, anything on this? Not a problem? No, it looks like it's a large enough lot meeting all the setbacks, drainage, heating, and all no. Yeah. You know, for the size of the building and the size of the lot, we didn't have any concerns. Okay, I'll entertain a motion from either one of you may care to make a motion. To approve the According to the findings of fact, yes, so, you know, the planner's report, and yes. there are conditions. no conditions, are the, the, the conditions as well. Second, no second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, none. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Might, guys. might as well stay up. <laughs> Next you. item on the agenda is conditional use permit application 002-23 to construct a 36 by 6, 56 foot accessory structure to facilitate storage for existing business within the central business CB zoning district. Subject property is located at 25188 Hazelwood Drive, PID 28110594. Owner applicant, Gary Kent Hilton. Again, the, the owners are here and yes. identified themselves previously. Um, anything no further information? Okay. Um, any comments from commission members or engineer, city council? Nothing that hasn't already been said. Okay. Again, I'll entertain a, 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 anybody from the audience care to have anything to say on this? Okay. I'll entertain a motion. Well, for clarification, this is for the actual conditional use permit, not the variance. First one was a variance. Now this is the conditional use yeah. permit. Yeah. Uh, I have a, Bethany, I have a question. Yes. First one as liaison. I'm not able to make a motion, am I? No. I thought not. Yeah. So no. that's why I'm looking at it. Mr. Taylor. Motion to approve, again, based on the findings of fact and the, and the city staff report and the conditions. Second. Second. Opposed? 
All right, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Let there be none. Done. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Turn this off. And just move it. You can leave. Thank you. Entertain a motion to close the public hearings. Mr. Taylor. Say again. I need a motion to close the public hearings. We only had the one public hearing tonight. Public second. No, second. Second. And all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Let there be none. New business. Uh, we have Shoreland Ordinance listening session tonight to provide feedback and discuss proposed changes to the Shoreland Ordinance. Note the session is for discussion only and the Planning Commission will not be recommending approval or denial at this time. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it back over to Bethany and the planner. Thank you very much. Chris Pence, if you'd like to come up, take a seat. <laughs> Evening, Chris. I'm good. You and yourself? You've been busy. Yeah. It was great. Spent all of New Year's Day reading that Charland ordinance. Well, I guess it took me half to I took two. I, I took two. Toward all, both towards the end. So. So, public proceedings. You can go ahead and start. Right. Well, so we've got for you tonight. Uh, there's the. Uh, is that better? There we go. Now you can hear me. That helps. Um, is the uh, proposed uh, draft version of the ordinance in its entirety? So it includes uh, made you know changes and modifications that we've been discussing for the last few months to the shoreland piece. It's got some new definitions cleaned up and added. Uh, it's also basically been taken and and uh, put in a spot in the ordinance where it belongs. And I've worked with Bethany. We've gone through the remaining part of the ordinance and made a few revisions so we didn't have any of that double speak that we were stuck with kind of before. Um, and so, you know, from the long and short of it, um, I think you've got a good ordinance and I think it's ready to be um, go through the process of the public review mm -hmm. and, you know, going through the different um, hearing or hearings, however, the council chooses to do that. Um, or Jake, can you go through the letter from the Lake Association or do you, how do you want to do that? Um. That actually is not from a lake association. That's just from a. a oh, it's just from. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Would you like to go through it? You don't need to go through it, but if you want to, yeah, you can. I mean, um, we just got an email this afternoon um, from a, a citizen of Lakeshore. Yeah. Um, he had some questions and some concerns. It's the first that we've gotten public comment wise, so we'd be happy to address those. And we maybe we want to wait to do that until anybody else in the crowd that wants to. We could save this to the end and see if anybody else in the crowd wants to come up and have anything to say about the ordinance or uh, the commission members who I'm hoping hope to. Uh, any feedback at this point so as a point of order are we going to uh, kind of go through this line by line and page by page or is 177 pages yeah when i looked at so to be honest um bethany has provided you a summary of that her and i've walked through that um i think it's a few page summary of what's been substantially changed in the ordinance um we could definitely go through that if you would like um i don't think we probably need to go through this ordinance line by line, page by page, but I think that summary that Bethany put together did a really nice job of uh, showing the changes that were made, you know, to the ordinance itself. Is Which, everyone familiar with that document that was emailed on Friday to you? And you? I thought you captured almost everything that we discussed in detail for almost those two hours that we were together last. She did a great job. With yeah. That. That's pretty impressive. Thank so, you. Yep. I that hope should it help helps. the council, I think, to digest a little bit of what's yes. before you. So. Yeah. Can you go through that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Be happy to. Yeah. Yeah. I've got it up it on the I'll, wall. You want to go through it and I'll back you up with anything else? Yeah. So what I did is I basically just put a quick document together showing uh, the portions of the ordinance that we have currently um, versus what is proposed. Um, and the last column is just notes. It's a just an easy way to uh, differentiate between things of importance and whether or not we've changed anything or whether or not we haven't. Um, so I sec uh, separated into articles. 
So uh, the first portion is Article 1, that's in general. Um, Chris, if you could talk more about this as far as state requirements and the legal portions, yep. um, that would be great. Yep. So anytime you have an ordinance um, that you put together at a local level like this, you, you have to have, you include things like intent and purpose, uh, your statutory authorization, policy, what's your jurisdiction, severability. I mean, these are all just the, the legal sidebars that provide to you a, a document that is an actual enforceable ordinance. So you know, you have, you, you are, you only, the only reason the city gets to provide um, a local ordinance is because the state of Minnesota allows you to, through Minnesota statute 462, that's your statutory authorization. Uh, there's a policy statement in here that basically says that, you know, the purpose of this, you know, ordinance is for orderly development and natural resource, you know, um, protection within the city, your jurisdiction, severability means, um, if there's a different ordinance or um, something else that's out there that that uh, that would interact with this, the greater restrictive applies, abrogation and greater restrictions. Um, the key, I think, the big change to this is is now knowing when um, what the first adoption of the ordinance was. I think that's July twenty July seventeenth, nineteen seventy. So that's a big deal. That's that's really the where the line of that establishes your nonconformities within the city without having that date of first when you first drafted an ordinance. It's hard to really do um, to be able to enforce non-conforming uses within the city. And then the last part is just your interpretation and intent. How you know how do you interpret the ordinance? What's the intent? Why is it there? And it, which, which we, what we've done in this is just reduced a lot of the other language that was there, and a lot of our language that was in the current ordinance is just been moved to uh, to Article Two um, to be more consistent and easier to follow. So most nobody reads sections one through seven. That's just the legal sidebars that provide a legal ordinance. And the reasons for changing the definitions to the back of the ordinance, if you could speak to that, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, in all the years I've done ordinances, um, it's it's typically a little bit, the, the ordinance that I've seen that have led with the definitions is just a little bit confusing and it doesn't seem to flow naturally from the ordinance. So a, a definition section is really more of an appendix than it is a lead off to the ordinance. So the, the lead off to the ordinance is general ordinance provisions and that. And if you need to reference a term, then you get like a glossary. You go to the back and you find what that term means. So it's just just for more more better flow of the ordinance and easier readability. Any questions on that first portion? All right. So the second uh, portion is Article Two. Article Two is district uses um, and districts. Uh, we have that broken up into Division Two, which is the general zoning provisions, and D Division Three, which is administration. Um, the biggest portions of these two are um, that we added shoreland alteration permits for projects within the shoreland impact zone. That's going to help people develop their property with clearly defined rules and requirements. Um, and then we also changed the expiration of permits uh, from our ordinance currently says that uh, they expire 12 months from when work commences. So there's a lot of gray there, right? So we've changed that just to expire tw uh, 24 months or two years from the date of issuance. And, and this is more of the administrative side of the ordinance. And so if you look at division two, that talks more about zoning districts and conformity and what's the responsibility of the applicant and the contractor. And then you get into administration and it defines your land use permits, your shoreline alteration permits, um, certificate compliance needed for septic systems. What do I need to submit for a permit? What are the general reviews required? Um, if you go to the next page, Bethany. Feel free to ask any questions. Yeah. Very informal. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, first, did you, take you could just come up and speak. Sure. That'd be great. Thank you. I haven't read it, but um, I'm pretty familiar with it. Uh, have you changed the zoning? Did the zoning map distances, setback distances off the lake change? No. No. Okay. Um, back up in Article 2 or Article 3 there, um, what were what were the main changes with the districts then or the zones? It was just reorganization. Reorganization. Just, just getting it organized into, uh, okay. again, more of a flow and easier to read. So the numbers, nothing changed with the zoning map or with any of those things whatsoever. That what about with overlap in regards to commercial in this zone? Anything with there that talks about how the two integrate? 
I think with I, like density coverages, previous coverages, screening requirements. Okay. You know, between if you talk with commercial to residential, there's screening requirements has to be, but that was nothing that was any different than what was currently in the ordinance. Okay, so all that stayed the same too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we did a big restructure, right? Because right. the ordinance yep. was kind of pieced together and oh, whatnot. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the changes are just structural, um, but as far as like performance standards and that, that pertains more to the shoreland uh, sure. than commercial we at didn't this touch, point. Like commercial. And no, yeah, but there's <clears throat> in the city of Nestle, there's a lot of overlap yeah. and interface with that. And so I was wondering, you know, if there's any new language written when the two overlap and fall underneath both jurisdictions, so to speak. You don't want to there, step back stuff. Nothing specific, but what I would say is that the way the ordinance would read, and you go back to that first section, it talks about um, the greater restrictions apply. So if there's two restrictions, you've got two ordinances, the right. greater restrictions apply to the, to the property. Okay. So if you had a, if you had something in the, in the shore, because it was in that thousand feet of the lake, right. and it was also commercial, then you would apply the, the most restrictive part of the ordinance to that. Right, because like, for instance, going up Hazelwood, and like where this property, what this was just approved yep. is actually, you know, would be greater restrictions, you know, right. on that thing. And nothing's changed with that, correct? Nope. Nothing's okay. changed as far as accessory structure size, uh, condition lift permit requirements needed. That and that was the reason for the 200 square foot on this property, correct? Um, yeah, our ordinance right. um, has in the central business district, which is there's two commercial or three right. commercial districts and the central business district doesn't allow anything over 200 square feet right. accessory structure, which if you look at central, like Main Street, right. that makes sense. But this property. Um, well, know, what I'm saying in essence, it falls within the thousand square feet accessory structure is uh, subject to the right. shoreland rules. Right. Yeah. Subject to the shoreland rules, mm -hmm. which is even. 120 square feet, okay. That the short rules don't, that's only for water or access. Oh, only for the, the water. Okay. Right on the water. Yeah. Off the water, there's no, the short rules don't have any restrictions except for your improvement. Okay. No, good questions. Yeah, keep them coming. Absolutely. Well, I'll, yeah. There's so I'm, I haven't read it, read it, so I apologize, but no, no, I'm just asking questions. Yeah, so. no, good. Feel free. Okay. So go ahead. I, I'll ask one. And then once we get into this next section here, um, you can see on the right, again, it was just more of a reorganization. Um, you'll see some areas in the ordinance are a little bit shorter than they were previously. For example, under variances and um, let's see, like non-conformities, we made a reference directly to the statute instead of actually taking the statute, put in the ordinance, because the minute the legislature makes a change in, this, in the statute and you have it in the ordinance, you gotta change your ordinance. We're just now saying, we need to comply with the, the non-conformity section of 462, and we need to comply with the variant section 462 um, when you're looking at section 20-30. So those are so that was probably the on those, I would say those would probably be the, the, the change of just why is it shorter, simply because of uh, just trying to make it so you try I when I first started writing ordinances a long time ago, um, I wanted everything in the ordinance. So you went there and just read it, and then I got tired of revising ordinances every time the legislature decided they want to change something this just this just makes more sense and it's simpler to simpler to administer and then we jump down into division four and this is where um we got into the requirements as far as shoreland uses minimum lot sizes and the only change that was made to lot sizes was for general development lakes that are on a septic system, lot size would be 30,000 square feet instead of 20,000 square feet. Everything else stayed the same. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. Another? This is where most of the changes um, was yep. in this division for um, having right. to do with performance standards. Um, so there was no change to the definition of district. So all the districts stayed the same. We're not touching that. We're not reviewing that at this point. Um, in the land use table, however, we did make some changes. We removed the detachable vestibules, which we all had no idea what that was in reference to. Um, we removed um, grading and dirt moving. Um, there's a portion on dirt moving in the ordinance and in the shoreland um, area now that specifically addresses that. Um, municipal sewage disposable parks, snowmobile trails, and utilities we removed. Um, we did add alternative access lots, and we added home business, and we added schools. We also edited adult uses and decks. So if anybody has any questions about the land use table and the edits and 
changes made. A future project would be to uh, would be to look at your definitions um, that you currently have now and compare them to your land use table and make sure you have a definition for every use so that nobody can question what, what, what. we know what certain terms mean. Um, you know, common speak like restaurant, but you might want to you need to further define that. What did the restaurant mean to the city of Nisswa? And that mm -hmm. so there's a lot of terms in your land use table that aren't defined in the ordinance, and that's that's a future project that I would uh, recommend that you would. Uh, work on at some point. Yep. Sorry. Just quick question with that. So you did not change any definitions with like dirt moving there or are, grading? Um there Those are definitions did change or did not? We added we added an entire section of the ordinance for performance based performance centered on dirt moving within the short term. Sure, but um did dirt is there a definition defined for dirt moving? Well you be very familiar. It's the 30, 50, 100 that you're very used to in the right. different zones with the shoreland impact. In the different zones. One and okay. two, yep. Yeah. But did, um, specifically, does it up, does it um, give reference to if somebody moves one yard of dirt from where the chairs are to over where your desk is and then move it from the desk back to the chairs on the same property? Did they move one yard of dirt or didn't they then move two yards of dirt because it was a yard from there to here and back. Is there definitions defining language like that? Yep. So what we have in the definition right now for dirt moving, grading, excavation is any movement, excavation, grading, or filling of dirt on a lot. Just period. And then if you get to the section of the ordinance that addresses um, that, then it gets a little bit more. Um, it gets more specific as to what's uh, what's expected as far as. Um, let's see if I can find it here. Okay, get close. Well, I'm finding it here. Yep, so we've got activities. This is in section. The top of it. It's pretty extensive. It'd be worth looking at. Section 20 59. And um, basically, it, fill, it explains what the different requirements are for short pack zone one, short pack zone two, and the lot zone addresses historic ice bridges. Um, temporary, you know, like a yearly ice bridge that happens from year to year. Yep. Yep. Um, and then what it, let's see, what, um, does it specifically identify how yardage of dirt being moved is calculated? Uh, let's see. So you're wondering if we count both cut and fill? Right on that. And is it cut and fill on the property or cut and fill removed from the property? And, you know, um, imported, exported, you know, does it speak to that language? Uh, not what I'm seeing. No, not not to that. Uh, not for a calculation. Not that I'm not control. seeing that. Right. What it basically does is it, it you know, I think the, the yardage of the 30, 50, and then I think it's the 100 based on short zone one, two, and three. Right. Um, I, I just ask because this is, this is um, something that's been open for interpretation. Yeah, and as the people have changed, specifically with the city of Nisswa, um, the term and the interpretation of this has also changed. And I would just say that it's something that needs to be more clearly defined and addressed with this, and also in regards to then orientated auxiliary structures. You know, if you look at the building permit and code, as far as a structure goes, there is not a dirt minimum or yardage move, you know, like building a house, whatever. 
nobody requires, you can only move 10 yards of dirt. So in getting a building permit for a building like that, is the dirt moving for the building part of that 30, you know, Wait, zone or is that relative to the building? That's a good question. So, yep. so if you go back to the very first sentence of section point S six and twenty dash fifty nine, it says the standard of the section shall apply to all dirt moving increments. So it applies to everything. So at that point, um, I would argue based on that wording and, and the reason it's there is to say that if you're going to do any dirt moving within short drive zone one, 30 yards, either you bring it in. You move it. You get to, you get to, you get to move around thirty yards within within thirty seven half feet of the lake. Mm -hmm. You get to move around thirty yards, and so that would apply to if they wanted to go in and build their water into a pedestrian structure lane, they could move up to thirty cubic feet, thirty cubic yards of dirt to put a place in that structure. If they want to go above and beyond that. The commission is permitted. Okay, so you were saying that would apply. What about um, you know what about sand blankets on going? Maintenance with sand blankets. 30 yards, 30 yards per year. 10 cubic yards annually, oh, you can add to an existing add, sand yeah, blanket. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you can, there's 10 yards to add. And so annually, annually, you can add that without a permit. Yep. 30 total for one permit of the life of the property? No. No. For so one, 30, 30 yards year. per permit? And then you can get a permit once every well, three years. Also, a maximum of 50 cubic yards of dirt moving may be permitted as well. Shore back zone. Yeah. Shore. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's broken down into zones. So you've got right. the SIZ1, right. which is 30 cubic yards, and you've got the SIZ2, which is 50 cubic yards, and then the rear lot zone, which is up to 100 cubic yards. Right. And it's 20 foot setbacks for the oriented water structure. Yep. We right. Yeah, we've got all these performance standards and we'll go through them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just, yeah, just those, those certain were... questions, issues that I know have arisen yeah. time and time again here. And if we're doing this, yeah, we've got those sure. standards. Yeah. In there. Well, this is what the listening right. session's for. Yeah. So ask questions, please. Yeah, for sure. Um, water oriented accessory structure. So uh, 120 uh, square feet of size, 12 feet in height. And setback is 20 feet from the orange setting. Yeah, that's a bad Maximum 30 yards of dirt to move around to, to go over the side. Okay. And, that's and, a, operation from right. and it's 120 square feet now, not 150? 120. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you can do commercial as 250. Okay. Um, what about rooftops? Does that? We've said that um, for a water or accessory structure, the roof pitch, what do we decide on? 412. Yeah, 412. Yep. Not that it has to maintain a 412. They can't put a flat roof on. And, Correct. Uh, okay. Without a variance. They would need a variance to do a flat roof. Flat roof for variance. Unless they're replacing the existing structure. That's right. There, and they can just replace the current pitch. Okay. Okay. Good questions. Yeah, it's just stuff I'm asking. So go, go ahead. Keep going, I guess. Uh, well, I think that'd be a good point to add about the actual interpretation of calculations for them because everybody. It's calculated different. <laughs> if you're everywhere in construction I and you're, or you're not, it is many things are interpreted differently. So right. uh, I think that might be something worthwhile adding in there. It's the whole, it's been the whole point of this actually since it starts. So, yeah, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Good point, Absolutely. Joe. Uh, Part of what you see right now, like under, I don't know, you want to talk about 48 now, the building heights, make sure that everybody's on, on board for going with that. Um, yeah. I think that'd be a good, I think that might be one that we want to make sure that everybody's in agreement with. Yeah. Let's go and find it here. We can go through that. We're proposing a building height increase from 25 feet to 30 feet. Yeah, so it's right. So, um, building height, we said well, we went to 30 feet from 25. 25. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Yep. Yep. Is that better? That might make it easier. Yeah, so that was that was a change. Is just going building height. We went up to thirty 
went up to 30 feet on that one previously it was at that 25. And the definition is still halfway the mid, you know. Yep, we got a the, uh, the definition has a has a drawing to it. Let me see here. It's the same definition, just a new number? Yes. So it's it's uh, so it is it is the it is the definition that came from is that picture so the, so the only other question with this the thirty feet is it measured off the highest elevation on the property or is it determined by so many feet from the house or where can people measure the thirty feet off of. Uh, does that question make sense? The vertical distance may be x between the lowest adjacent grade of structure and feet above the highest ground level of the So it's basically adjacent to it. Adjacent. Okay. Okay. And they've got we've, there's uh there's some drawings in there that give you kind of an idea of what we're trying to this. It can be a little bit confusing. Building height can be uh, right. Yeah. It's and definitely not not once clear. again. There's a lot of interpretation on that. Yeah. For sure. If you could speak to us of why we did that or why we proposed that. The, from our meetings with the contractors and whatnot. Yeah, the, it basically with uh, my experience with the contractors in the past has just been it provides a little bit more flexibility for some of the you know frankly the you know, a lot of high end houses that come around the lakes and they want some flexibility as to how they can yeah. make some of those roof roof lines right. run the right way and um, you know the the county has it at thirty five feet that's their max building height is thirty five so. Um, 30, I think is kind of a, you know, this, the short rule is about 25, but I can't think of too many places anymore that have a 25 foot height limit for a building that's been typically between that 30 to 35 number. Quick question, maybe with that thing, side yard setback. Sure. Is that changed? Uh, the, the lot line setbacks have been reduced in certain areas. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Yep. We got that reduced down, I believe it was down to 10. Down to 10. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not in all districts, though. Not in all districts, so no. Nope. So let me, we did remove, um, there was, there we go, lot line right here. Um, in open space residential, the lot line would be 20. Um, in shoreland, uh, urban residential, um, highway business, that would all be 10. Central business would still be zero and commercial uh, waterfront would be 30. Yep. So your general shoreline is now 10. 10. Yeah. General shoreline. Mm -hmm. yep. 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 All right. And as Chris said earlier, um, the riparian lots that are not connected to city sewer would increase in lot size by 10,000 square feet. Um, and then all uh, non-riparian lots connected to city sewer would be reduced to that 20,000 square foot requirement that would allow for more density um, where there is city sewer available. Yep. A lot line setbacks are reduced. Um, we did remove uh, the side lot line corner. We removed that requirement and the rear yard setback requirement. Oh, it's just any lot line that was 10 feet. Mm -hmm. So rear, rear is 10 side. feet also? Yes. Yep. Within the within the setback definitions and rules, does that apply to only structures? Um, example, what about sidewalks, driveways, that sort of stuff that's yep. allowed in that zone still? Yep. Driveways yep. do have a specific uh, setback of five feet, so that would still apply. The driveway does, but I don't think we have anything in in, in for a uh, for like a uh, sidewalk, sidewalk, anything mm -hmm. like that. There are patio setbacks as well. Those yep. we okay, so changed. we. You do have them for patio, but you do not have them for sidewalk. Correct. Correct. And you have definitions defining the difference between the sidewalk and a patio. We have a patio defined. Mm -hmm. And then walkways. Yeah. You know, okay. And it's five feet for a patio from a sidewalk line. I'm sorry, what? It's five feet from that side lot line for a patio. I think the intent was that, you know, a, you know, a Sidewalk is temporary, just up and down where, you know, you could have people, you know, sitting around a fire and, you know, try to get a little bit off that property line to, 
just maybe accommodate that for the neighborhood side of it for the neighbor. All right, we also included that pervious pavers are to get 100% credit. Uh, there's a lot of good reasons why. Chris, if you want to yeah. talk about how yeah, that Yeah, absolutely. Pervious, pervious pavers are, you know, that you, uh, materials, you can use it as a paver. It can be um, a pervious blacktop, pervious cement. Um, and if when they're built according to the manufacturer specifications, uh, they will allow water to, to, uh, to soak through them and not run off like you would a, a typical um, hard surface and they just require maintenance. And so uh, for this provision to be allowed in the ordinance, um, the, the landlords will have to certify um, on a yearly basis that, that those pavers are being are still functioning and that is typically getting a vacuum um, out to the site once a year to, to clean out any sediment and debris that's on there to continue it working as a pervious, uh, pervious product. So it gives, otherwise the, the, the way the rule works now is that you get 50% credit. Zero. zero. Well, zero now, but yeah, oh, okay. I meant, to, I meant to say is that from the pollution control agency standpoint, when they look at the state shoreland, um, their, their storeland, blah, 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 the stormwater rules that they've got in place, um, they do give a, they recommend a 50% credit and no higher. And this one we allow, we're proposing 100% to provide if maintenance is done on the, on the pavers. Does that, does that, um, require engineered drawings to get that? It depends on the size. So if it's a smaller project and you follow the, the specs, it works. But if it's over a certain square footage, then you have to have it engineered. For patios and driveways, depending upon the size. Yeah, I think it was four hundred square, square feet. feet. So we, we wanted to we wanted to make sure that if you wanted to do a four hundred square foot patio with pervious, that you could. But once you got it in that allowed the, the that the Patio to made pervious, but once you got above and beyond that, then it would have to have that engineer sign off on it. So is there language that speaks to the different setbacks and then, you know, your 37 and a half feet, you know, 400 square feet. I'm just assuming, you know, after yep. your 50 Patios? feet. Yep. Yep. It's all defined. Um, does it speak to you then not putting a patio in 500 square feet permeable in those zones? Oh, does that to allow it to like to have more patio? Right, because have you do a bigger pervious? square foot with zero coverage. No, but how do, it how doesn't does that, to that. How, how do the two of them integrate? You know, in areas like that. If you want to, so basically, you can get a two hundred fifty square foot patio with a permit. If you want to go to four hundred, then you need a stormwater management plan. And so, if your stormwater management plan is to do pervious pavers, you're good to go. Or of a pervious material, yeah. right? So that's you, you. You can only get up to four hundred square feet by doing the stormwater. And if your stormwater plan is to create a pervious patio, right. then you've you know, you've accomplished that. And you couldn't um, go you couldn't go above that without a variance, the four hundred square feet. Um, sidewalks within that zone would do the rules speak to if that pushes you at that four hundred level or over. So the four hundred for square feet plus a four foot sidewalk. And the walk paths um, would be the one walk path for lake access, not to exceed four feet in width, um, the length of which is determined yeah, and by so the I, lot. So I would argue so. that you could have a four square foot patio, and then you could have a four foot walkway that comes from the house yep. next door that's 400 plus the four foot. So, and yeah. that would be permissible yep. in the language. Speaks yeah, as long as it's adjacent okay. to, you know, as long as it terminates and it's adjacent to that patio. Or the patio is over here and your access to the dock is over here. You can still have a sidewalk over here. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You could have a sidewalk over there. Yep. Okay. You get you get that one walkway. Yep. yep. Just one yep. walkway for lake access. Mm -hmm. uh, the building height increase we already discussed. Uh, lake setbacks on parcels with fringe wetlands to be measured from the OHW. Currently, we have um, the lake setback starting from the edge of the wetlands landward, um, and uh, that's. Uh, not as clear and not as standardized as going from the OHW. The OHW does not change, whereas wetland boundaries change. So best practice is that a wetland delineation is about good for five years. Yeah, three, um, to five, yeah. three to five, okay. And, uh, and so uh, this way we are able to not permit a project and then have it become non-conforming five years later because the wetland boundaries have now changed. Um, so the OHW is a, a much better, more standardized approach to calculating that does the type of wetland matter no no you can have a wetland fringe and the ohw can 
cut right through the middle of it. It's but just, it doesn't matter the thing. vegetation type and what type not of for OHW, Not for OHW, I think. No, okay. not for the OHW. That's just a set elevation. Yeah. Uh, we did no changes with accessory structure requirements. The tables that we're used to, there's no change whatsoever. 20-141D um, has been removed. It spoke to conditions being placed on animal husbandry and agricultural uses in the OSR. It was not necessary. Um, we did do some changes to travel trailers. Uh, travel trailers used as dwelling units do not require a permit if used for less than seven consecutive days. After seven consecutive days, they need a permit. Um, permits shall not be issued on parcels without a primary dwelling, um, but travel trailer permits can be issued in conjunction with a valid land use permit. In other words, if somebody has a parcel of land and they want to come and use it for the weekend and it's just using their RV for up to seven days, they're able to do that. Um, after that, it's considered kind of a dwelling unit and it would need a permit. Um, it wouldn't and we would require that the primary dwelling would be there. Um, the reason that we also added that um, we can do a travel trailer permit on a um, empty lot in conjunction with the valid land use permit is a lot of people like to stay in their RVs while their houses are being built and we'd like to accommodate that for them. Any questions on travel trailers? For performance standards, we um, removed stairways, lifts, and landings for lake access structures. Stairways, lifts, and landings are addressed in portions that we then added, but we did add swimming pools, lowest floor elevation, uh, water supply and sewage treatments, uh, special land use provisions, impervious coverage limits, stormwater standards, shoreline buffer standards, shoreline vegetation standards, bluff and steep slope standards, uh, mm -hmm. dirt moving and grading, retaining walls, riprap boardwalks, private water access ramps controlled and alternative accesses. Uh, stairways, walkways, lifts, and landings, water-oriented accessory structures, boathouses, patios, decks, and use of fertilizer. We also edited temporary structures, guest cabins, and guest quarters, agricultural uses, and animal husbandry in the OSR. Um, Quick question on yep. those. Yep, I'm going to get to them right here. We okay. can go through them. Square foot on the landing sizes? 32 square feet. Okay. For the stairways walks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I can maybe touch on the stormwater standards. I think this is probably the the the, the most important part of the ordinance, uh, in my opinion, which is basically defining what stormwater management standards are for the city. Um, it, it meets the standards of the Minnesota Stormwater Manual, which is the stormwater manual says you should treat a 1.1 inch rain event. And so we decided to go with what's a little bit easier, a one inch rain event, as that collects most of the, as you can see from there, uh, the, um, nutrients, pathogens, toxins, debris, and, and heat from the runoff. Uh, and so you need to be able to treat for a one inch rain event, be able to pass a hundred year event, which is closer to five and a five point five 5.5 inches. But you want to be able to pass that so that if you do build um, retention or a, or a stormwater system, that it doesn't get washed out by a bigger rain event. Um, 15% is the is the impervious coverage um, that requires a stormwater plan. So if you're if you're going to go above 50% of the property, you need to develop a stormwater plan for um, for that parcel to treat that one inch rain event. Um, if you go from 15 to 20, um, under excuse me, under 15 does not require a stormwater plan, but there will be best management practices recommended by the department on a handout that people can implement by choice. Uh, 15 to 20 requires that in stormwater plan I mentioned previously, and then when you go above 20, it then requires a stormwater stormwater management plan and a shoreline buffer analysis to be to be uh, completed as well. That's that's probably the I would say the biggest part of of that. Now I will bring up this since this is probably the right time to bring it up, is that um, the comment that we received today from um, Brad Berkland states that he thinks that the um, impervious standards for NISVA are too high, and um, he recommends that uh, we would lower them to be more in line with Lake Shore and East Gull Lake. Um, so currently NISWA has a general development lake standard of 25%. Lake Shore has a 20% requirement as well as East Gull. And for recreational development uh, lakes, Lake Shore has a 20% number when East Gull has 15 
and then they will, and then for uh, natural environment lakes, uh, Nisswa reduces down to 20%, and uh, then Lakeshore has 15, and East Gull has 10. Um, as a point of reference to those numbers, uh, back in 2000, about 2005, the state went on a pro did a project with the DNR and uh, counties in this part of the state on their alternate standards to 6120, which is the rule that we're required to follow. They wanted to see if there'd be some alternative standards that would make sense. And so the recommendation out of those came for GD lakes to be at 15%, recreational development lakes to be 15, and natural environment to be at 12 um, with a provision allowing an increase of 5% impervious provided a stormwater plan is completed on the property. So those are the, right now, the, the impervious standards that we have in place are 25 for general development and recreational development, and then 20% for natural environment. And then the recommendation, or you know, the, the comments were to lower that down to be more in line with what maybe Lakeshore or uh, East Gull Lake have for their ordinance that they have over on their side of Gull Lake. My recommendation would be, um, I believe that the stormwater management provision of the ordinance makes sense. And I think it mitigates uh, when people decide to um, go to those higher numbers for impervious coverage. If you chose to go the route of wanting to um, implement um, a more uh, reduced standards for impervious, um, I would recommend that to be on, on new lots with that haven't had a lot built on them yet, because if you change this now down to 15% on GD lakes, you will be seeing an ungodly amount of variances and that's all you'll ever do is in variances because of that number. You've already got your city is pretty well built up. There aren't a whole lot of vacant lots left anymore. I don't think if I'm looking at it. So I, you know, I'm not a impervious is very important to water quality, but I really think that if you were to really lower that down to some of these numbers, I think you'd see a lot more variances. And I don't think the bang for the buck would be there. But can I, can I will I, do whatever you tell me to, and I'll put it in the ordinances however you want. So, can I ask a clarifying question? So, with that, what you're saying is up to 15, no shoreline, no stormwater. Correct. 15 to 25. Correct. Stormwater. Yep. And then over 20 stormwater and shoreline buffer assessment to see if you need more, you know, more vegetation. For that, yes. Yeah. So, correct in saying that this ordinance follows the current Rowan County Yes, ordinance. it does. Yep. Word for word. Yeah, right. it does. Yep. yep. And so that was another piece of the ordinance. I'm glad you brought that up right. is just consistency, trying to have consistent rules on lakes that you share so that when somebody's on Lake Hubert, there's not one requirement on the side of the lake and another requirement on the other side, trying to be as consistent as possible. And so um, I, I personally think that this standard makes sense um, with the way you've got it laid out now. Um, you're more than, you know, if, if you felt it appropriate to reduce the impervious numbers down, we could definitely do that. Um, but um, I'm not sure that the there will be maybe the return on the investment hoped just because of the um, lack of, of new lots that you might be trying to do this on or, or that. I think you would have a lot of, you'd, you would create a lot of nonconformities the day you approve that ordinance. They could continue to, to persist, but it would anytime they want to do any further improvements, then they would be having to go through an extensive process to do other improvements to the property. Uh, we could jump into you've got we've got clear standards now as far as shoreline buffer management and vegetative mitigation and needed for um, certain activities like uh, over twenty percent of your impervious coverage and needed for variances. Um, conditional use permits, that sort of thing. Um, so that's basically more mitigative in nature for what people would do if they wanted to improve their property and they hit some of those requirements. Uh, the other one, 56, is just your vegetative standards. What If somebody has a piece of property now, what are they allowed to do on that property as far as removing vegetation and stuff? And, and uh, this comes right from, uh, right from the county ordinance that uh, seems to have worked well. And uh, um, I think it would work well here too as well. Can I ask one other quick question? Sure. With the um, um, water, you know, with the stormwater management plan, yep. um, do you guys list out who is eligible to do those homeowners? Are you guys going to provide like the county does on your website uh, a map to fill that out? And that will be provided now on the city site 
Yeah, and that yeah. doesn't apply to certain commercial projects, right. and um, those requirements for you know engineered yeah. plans yeah. are st still yeah. standing. Yeah. But yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, same, we have buff, you have your bluff and your steep slope vegetation standards. Uh, basically, you're really only allowed to remove vegetation in a bluff for the placement of a stairway, landing lift, or an access path. Um, you are allowed to remove if you have a tree that's uh, got a safety hazard or is diseased or is dead, um, but you really want to minimize that vegetation removal on any steep slopes or bluff. What's the side yard bluff setback? 10. Like 10. For a... Uh... For like a um, patio, water structure, neighbor has a bluff. So, the, so, a, so a patio or that would have to be 10, would have to be still meet the 30 foot bluff setback and then 10 feet from the side property line. So right. the bluff setback, that would be 30 feet. 30 feet from the 30 foot set side yard setback no. on a bluff. 30 feet from the bluff, 10 feet from the side yard. Yep. So where feet. the bluff stops, there is no setback. So that's what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Bluff comes down. Yep. You have your toe and your heel yep. right on the side. Yeah, you can go right up to the side of the block. There is no yep. block. The, way it, the way that it is now. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because like the county, I believe is ten or fifteen. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So or is city of Nassau would be zero yep. setback. I don't recall the county having. I'd have to pull that up again. I haven't yeah. looked. Yeah, Thornton County has one. Okay. I think it's. I think it's trying to figure 15. out. Because the, the, the bluffs are fun because you start at one area that's twenty five feet high and that's always you're just the, the issue is never the slope, and then it tends to do this. Right. And so when you get down to that point where it's twenty four point nine, then it, that was where you where you would pull the setback from where it was no longer a bluff. And so that would be the same applicability here as where it's no longer a bluff. Then then it would just be the the uh, if it's no longer a bluff, you meet the lake setback. Right. If it's no longer a bluff, so nothing on the side. So your neighbor has a bluff. It ends kind of on the property line. You could build right up to it. Right. All, setbacks. all the other setbacks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Let's see what's next. Here's the dirt moving piece. A lot of moving parts here, um, but basically there's provisions. Number two is the exemptions. You can do these activities uh, A through E. Don't require a permit, provided you follow the requirements there. Um, number three requires shows your shore impact zone requirements as far as. Um, what you're allowed to do, you can see a sand blanket there, your shore and recreational use area, you know, how much fill you're allowed to do upland, amount of wetland fill, ice ridges, either annual um, and historic. And then um, you jump down to activities in shore impact zone two, which is the second half of the setback. Um, and then upland fill wetland activities and then your activities in the rear lot zone, which is basically from the setback back of the set back to a thousand feet that's what that's what's allowed in the rear lot zone so basically the the, the restrictions are very tight within um the actual setback or the, the shore impact zone one is where the primary restrictions are and this is your standards not more than one permit um, shall be allowed in the same property in any three period so you could you could you can only apply for shore operation once every three years unless you're in shore impact zone two you know then you can do right in the rear the rear zone does not require for like patios in the rear zone after 75 feet. The rear low, the rear has a hundred cubic yards. And then um, that would be the maximum amount that you can right. allow for a patio construction of the hundred cubic yards. But still no um, permit requirements on the square footage as long as you're underneath the 15 or 25. Those those are the only right. Okay. Yep. Retaining walls, um, basically saying that they're only allowed in um, areas where control or where erosion control is is uh, an issue, and this is, is the solution to that. Four feet tall, you can you can bridge them back on top of each other. If you want to go higher than four, it has to be engineered. Can we talk about that quick? Mm -hmm. Four foot tall retaining wall that's boulder. Is there exemptions for engineering on boulder walls? I would say that the four foot, and this comes out of shoreline rules. Right. So, yep. so, yeah, so I would say once you hit four feet, tear it back. You know, so you mean you're not going to build a boulder wall that's going to go up, you know, 20 feet. You can go well, four feet, go back up. So no, but it, it's becoming a problem, you know, even in the county with this ordinance on four foot walls in quote unquote engineering a boulder wall. There's nothing to engineer. What I would what I would say is that from if, the information I've got from WSN and trying to have them do it, 
Well, what I would say is if you can find an engineer that will sign it, that's good enough for the county or for the, for the engineer, will, you know, and so that's a good question, Dave, is, is I mean, would, would there be a situation where a an engineer would, would sign off on a, on a boulder wall? So when you get to the point of four feet, the ordinance requires an engineer to prepare right. the plans. Um, and I think the intent of that is something more than four feet, four feet and higher. Right? Correct. No, right. I understand. So, but, you know, speaking for WSN, WSN currently, as of last year, there's nothing to engineer with a stack boulder wall. There's not tiebacks in it, how it's built, how it's constructed. Most of your walls are boulder. So in talking to the engineers, trying to do this at the county level and speaking to the engineer and the engineers are like, what do you want us to draw? Draw this boulder, stack it on that boulder. What are we engineering? The weight of the boulder, how one boulder is stacked on top of each other. I mean, it's an issue that I've dealt with many times now and it's, it's actually, you know, I brought it up at the county level and it's being talked about being changed or tweaked at the county level because there is actually nothing to engineer with it. Okay. And speaking with a lot of engineers, the last one we did get engineer is signed off by the cousin of the owner because sure. no local person would do it. So what I'm, you know, I get, I'm, I I'm, I'm just bringing it up, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a legitimate thing that I do with. So it, I, I think before we just blindly follow that and, you know, it, it will get brought up that it has been has been an issue now in the county with that rule okay i've dealt with that several times where i've struggled to get anybody to sign off on that right um and i my question to the engineer is there's a reason that they can't sign off oh. and is this something that they just right. shouldn't be doing a boulder wall over four feet it it's a difficult thing for an engineer to sign off on a boulder wall because it's not engineered materials yeah. right for one it's right. not an engineered system per se right. a lot of the system of an engineered retaining wall involves dealing with the type of soil and the drainage behind the wall right so the tie back it's the dead men hydrostatic right. pressure yep. being able to tie it back in with like you said right. dead, dead men or tensile fabric so that you're tying that boulder face back into the wall with, right. with what? How do you tie the boulders back? There isn't, the, it's, it's the just the sheer weight, it's a mass. Right. And it's so, also, hands down, the most common wall <laughs> throughout our area, the county and everything. And it, it, it's becoming, you know, you say yourself, you know, you've had a tough time getting engineers to sign off on it. And it's, you know, kind of, it's becoming a sticking point more and more. And the reason why it's also becoming a sticking point, people are building on lots that aren't flat level, all that's gone. Right. So retaining walls are becoming a bigger, right. a bigger thing. And so I would just say that we want to look into that rule a little bit more before. So the question I have for Dave would be, would you feel comfortable if the ordinance said that boulder walls, um, over four feet are exempt from engineering requirement to the ordinance for the city. Would you feel comfortable with that being in the ordinance or not? I think Exempted? there's gotta be some kind of standard because a vertical boulder wall doesn't seem safe to right. me. Right, that's my question too. It's, 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 it's a safety issue, help. right? That's all it really is. It's more of a and, safety issue. You know, should there be at least some minimum uh, can to the How high do they go? What's the highest? Five, five, right, but you know the safety aspect falls back on the contractor, the homeowner, the property owner, mm -hmm. versus you know the safety issue. The burden doesn't lie with the city on the safety. That's a question for the city attorney. That's a security right. question. I that's, think that's the easy answer. So, right. I will, I because might. even with the building code, you know, there's nothing underneath the state building code either that right. pertains to this because it's outside the building. Yeah. I just know that when a rock falls on somebody, they're going to sue anybody they can. So, you know, so the city will be at that going to be the issue. You know, I mean, right. they'll be, you know, is there a, like, is there a height limit? I mean, what's the tallest that you, how big of a boulder wall do you want to build? The, big, the biggest you'd ever want to build? Is it 10 feet, you think? or is it Oh, well, there's feet? boulder rolls in the area that we have pushing 15, 20 feet. Yeah. You know, they're set back and yeah, stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, okay. there's, you know, commercial ones all over. Yeah. 
you know, and, and so, you know, really it is an art form or whatever, but I'm just yep. challenging this single rule on that. You know, I'm not I'm, opposed to it. Right. I'm not opposed to what you're saying at all. Right. Don't tell me what to write and I'll put her in the rules for you. That's right. You know, there's gravity engineered walls. They're, they're huge blocks of precast block that, sure. that right. are, have no retaining system. They're a gravity wall, but they have engineered, um, steps to them okay interlock yeah right that makes interlocking sense. faces yeah and mm -hmm. then there's a you know based on the soil type and yeah. height you know a different type of canter back into right. the wall so you know is are you more likely to get a pe to sign off on that i would say yeah probably as yeah. opposed to you know no a state. boulder can have any number of faces to it it isn't Mm -hmm. an engineer interlocking face absolutely with the next and right now i'd actually remove the word boulder and put a natural stone because you know it's just not the round field stone anymore it's coming in from montana or wherever sure. you know so okay just to help define and clarify that because yeah. you know as bethany can attest to with the county it is it is an issue on this one sticking yeah. point sure makes sense yeah so what, whatever that's why it's great getting whatever people. whatever you guys want to decide but that that will be a point of contention moving forward yeah. if it stays that way one of the points though um if you look at 2060a the department determines that there's no other alternative to erosion control so, so we're already dealing with a situation where we have problems where we're having erosion where we're having that and then right. to just allow a rock wall that has a lot of irregularities and possible um you know so what percentage of these rock walls that you're building are because there's erosion there and you can't find any other reason to solve it? The percentage is because people are building on more on less desirable lots. Right. Because all the good properties take. Yeah. So this is like this is like and, and walls for like a walkout, right? Kind yeah. Of for a walkout yeah. for this, that, you know. Um, also too, you know, depending upon which zone it's in, you know, when people are excavating these houses now out and about, as you know. The dirt is encroaching into the different zones right, right. and stuff, and so okay, yeah. The big, the bigger house, the scenario. This, this is um, on a daily basis becoming pretty challenging to do. Okay, that so I just it's a good point. Whatever I, I hadn't I had feedback, I hadn't heard that. That's, yeah. that's news to me. So yeah. uh, you know, that's good to hear. Uh, we have riprap standards in place basically following DNR um, recommendations and requirements that they've got policy for. Um, anything over 200 linear feet of that is a DNR permit. So this is, I think the reason why you brought me in the first place was in boardwalk standards. <laughs> and we've got a long ways to get to from there to a boardwalk standard. But um, I think this makes sense. And uh, um, basically the big change to the boardwalk standards that are different than what the county ordinance has is that a it's got to be perpendicular to the lake you don't get to run any parallel right we don't want any of that two it's uh um it's the, the the construction is limited to the ohw anything beyond the ohw is in the bed of a public water that's a dnr permit they then they have to figure out get their dnr permits for that and then the other one is that you just don't want you to be 10 foot side yard setback you don't want to build your you know so it goes that way and all of a sudden your neighbor looking out and they see a you know, 45 degree boardwalk going out in front of their house because that's just the way they thought they wanted to run it. So it's that perpendicular piece and staying out of your neighbor's riparian area. This is a one that you brought up before the riparian, these access ramps. Basically, uh, they're allowed 15 feet in width. You can't use black, you can't use asphalt, and you can only use them on lakes that don't have a current public access. So if there's a public access, you can't get a public, you can't have your own private water access ramp. Does not stop you from having a level level lot that you can put your boat in all you want. You just can't construct yourself one to go on that. Right. Back to the boardwalk. Oh yeah. Question quick. Um in doc, are you talking to specific boardwalks on the shore? And then after the OHW, it's DNR jurisdiction, or are you saying you're creating an ordinance that goes out over the place of the water past the OHW? No, this this ordinance only pertains to the land that's under the jurisdiction of the city of Nisqual, okay. which is up to the OHW. Okay. Yep. And then after that, technically, it would be a dock. Yeah, a dock. Yep. Yep. 
uh, controlled and alternative access lots. So controlled uh, access lots are those lots that are offshore plats and you allow non-repairing owners to have access to the water. Those are still prohibited, nothing's changed there. Um, another sticky point that I think um, has been happening at the county recently is their alternative access lots. And basically what that is, is if you've got a, 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 some repairing lots that have a very wet front um, and is not really conducive to direct lakeshore access, the city can um, go through a conditional use permit and use an alternative access lot where you have a separate lot from the four, for example, and there'll be one lot coming out. And then um, that would be where their dock would be instead of having one that comes out front where you'd be going through those areas that are much more wet and not conducive to um, not conducive to having good waterfront access on the, to the riparian lots themselves. Not much of a change here. I mean, stairways, walks, lifts, and landings. This is all following the state show and rules yeah. as far as your width and your and that, but it does allow, we put in here the provision for commercial, if I remember right? Yes. Yeah, 64 so square feet 64. for commercial mm -hmm. and then eight feet wide for the stairway if you're on the commercial property. Water or into accessory structures, nothing's changed with this. And uh, um, this is still pretty much the same thing that was there in the previous ordinance. The addition here, you have no water commercial lots, you're allowed to go instead of the uh, 120, you're allowed 215 up to 15 feet in height. Boat houses still aren't allowed, but can be replaced pursuant to Minnesota statute 462.357. Patio provision, again, as we mentioned, um, 250 square feet is allowed, up to 400 square feet is allowed with an approved stormwater management plan according to the ordinance. Not much of a change there. Um, it's well defined, um, our other. Yep, our you're allowed to build, it is. you can build a patio behind the shoreline. Just in the setback, that doesn't require it. So it's just within the shoreline. Okay. Um, question though, with that, can you get a, does this permit to do a patio with in replace of the shoreline ordinance building for 120 square foot for a patio instead of a building? Yeah. Okay. Or a combination of the two, yeah. but not with 820. Okay. You end up with a 620 square foot water you know, combination. Right. Yep. Okay. Uh, swimming pool standards, when we're going to require, you know, um, swimming pools, guest cabin, guest quarter standards. This we clarified this. Um, the shoreline rules technically um, don't allow a guest cabin or a guest quarter scenario, in, in unless you have a double lot size. So if you're a GD, you need to have a hundred foot, two hundred foot wide lot. Um, this says we're going to allow guest quarters and guest cabins, one only, on the property, provided that there is a uh, um, there needs to be an analysis of the existing shoreline vegetation. And DNR has, uh, in the past, said that was a, a, a trade-off for them that they were willing to to deal to have is to have more shoreline rest, um, vegetation restoration projects. So, this 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 has been approved by DNR in the past, and I expect them to approve this. Decks. This allows basically says that decks can be built, and there is a provision to allow decks to be built closer to the lake, uh, based on if it's a non-conforming structure, which is now built prior to January seventeenth of nineteen seventy. There's a, a provision that, that's a percent setback to that. Again, we just include the fertilizer setback. It's uh, fertilizer requirements that's in statute and it's enforced by Department of Ag and the PCA, but we're putting in there is just more informational for people to know. One of the notes I had actually was on section 2070 guest cabin and guest quarters. Uh, I understand the difference in the term guest quarters to guest cabin, Yep, but the verbiage is pretty similar outside of the, the numerical side of it. Correct. It just why have the difference, I guess. It, it clarifies that because what 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 we're, the situation was that somebody would build a guest cabin. Yeah. And then next thing you know, they build a garage and they put one on top of that. And we said, well, you already got one of those. Well, that's not a guest cabin. It's something else. And so we're saying you can either have a, a standalone guest cabin structure. Sure. Or you can have one on top of a garage, but um, having both would, would not be mm -hmm. um, okay. in line with the show and rules. Is the difference defined by plumbing and water? Uh, it's defined by livable area. And so um, it, it has to have, you know, you could have obviously 
build a garage with stores over top of it and that doesn't make it you know it has to have livable area in it like you said sewer water kitchen facilities that sort of thing to be considered and be considered an actual guest it would not prohibit somebody from you know having their grandkids come up for a week and they put you know um, cop up there next to the right yeah usually it's the sewer water yeah, thing water's that's been the yep been the dictating factor yep sewer water yep exactly yeah Bethany, I know that's kind of the, that's where the shoreline part of it ended. And then we had to make a few changes to just line up the rest of the ordinance to make it, you know, to make it fit. Yep. Just one other quick question, if I may. Um, with this, does it, uh, what's the ordinance say in pertaining to lot splits, lot sizes, associations, you know? Let's say somebody has a big parcel, wants to put in a common, common access stock. Division rules were not touched. So you're not touching any of those touch there's, rules yep, there's one area that we did um and we'll get to that shortly okay all right does anyone else have any questions concerning the performance standards that we changed any additions or anything okay all right the next one was uh commercial uh, all we did was remove the water oriented accessory structures portion from that we addressed that in the prior article and we removed the lake access structures because once again, that was addressed elsewhere. Everything else remained the same. Um, for article four, stormwater management protection and drainage, we removed everything but parking and loading as we had addressed it in the performance standards. Yep. Um, article five is special locations and uses. We made no changes. Okay, and Article 6 oh, sub... Yeah, the 12%, that's right. Yep, Article 6 subdivisions um, we are proposing um, in... I'll pull that up in just a moment. There's a portion that requires when you are splitting a lot or you are um, proposing a plat, et cetera, that you remove the 12% slope areas um, as part of the lot size requirement. Um, we feel that that is um, a little bit onerous for owners as um, usually 15 to 18% slope is a requirement for a good walkout. Um, we don't feel that that should be um, a threshold. Um, yeah, the 12% the the 12 is more of a steep slope standard for when you're looking at um, like bare soils and that like, like what's the same idea of, of a bluff. And so that 12% really didn't apply in this area as far as Looking at you know your lot size and stuff, um, twelve percent would be a little bit more restrictive than, I, and it would probably accomplish what it was trying to do. We made a few other changes, including um, just putting floodplain regulations. It's all just terminology that we fixed up in that portion as well. And Chris, if you want to speak as to the comments that we got from Brad Berkland today yeah, concerning absolutely. Uh, the slope. Yeah. So the, again, we go back to that um, same conversation I just mentioned that. Um, uh, feels the uh, Brad feels that the 12% uh, slope um, shouldn't be changed to 20% because he's concerned about um, erosion and um, the slope land in Iswa is value you know, vulnerable for erosion without um, without that 12% slope so 12% um, is uh, there's nothing in the state standards that's a requirement up or down so it's really dependent on what it is that you guys would like to see in that ordinance. I think what Bethany is mentioning makes sense. And I think it, uh, um, I, I don't, it just really is helping to determine, you know, your lot size and being able to allow, you know, a little bit steeper slope to be considered for lot size when you're developing it. Yeah, and to make the clarification that that is in regards only to lot size, it's not for buildability. Uh, sure. We don't go on a parcel and go, I'm sorry, you can't build something on a 12% slope. We don't. We'll issue the permit. That's perfect. As long as they meet the side yard setbacks, et cetera, um, that would be a perfectly fine use. Much like I said, a walkout needs 15 to 18% is what I've yep. heard. Just for, just, for the, just for the actual lot size, mm -hmm. for the bulk yep. area. Yep. Yep. Um, Another change that had that uh, we made, it, it doesn't, it really isn't substantive, I don't think, but as far as we look at the definition of how you determine a, a top of a bluff or a toe of a bluff, um, basically what you're looking at, it's a, you take a segment and then there's a slope at the top and when it reaches 18%, that's the top and it's, so that, it's at a 50 foot segment. 
and I've been on the ground and I've tried to hold a 50 foot segment with a tape and then try to get somebody up top to hold it straight. And so we reduced it to 10 to a 10 foot segment. It didn't substantially change what was a bluff and what wasn't a bluff. It just made it more useful, made it easier to actually do the work. Bethany says that she's perfectly happy with the 50 feet because she makes all the fancy, uh, you know, surveyors and that do the work. So I, I don't have any issue either way how you do it. So it can be a 10 foot segment or a 50 foot segment. I don't think it's substantive in the, in the return on what's determined to be a bluff or not, but um, I'm okay with either way. So I lean more to keeping the 50. Yep. But yep. yep. 50 feet works for me. Yep. I have no problem with that at all. All right, any other questions on that portion? Okay, we'll try to get through these real quick. Um, signs, uh, nothing changed, but we still need to uh, change Muni code from our recent uh, amendment to the sign ordinance this summer. Um, other standards and special uses, uh, we edited home occupation and we added home business. And I'm gonna try to just really clarify this really quickly. Um, home occupation, let's see if I can get this right. Home occupation is somebody is conducting a business of commercial nature at their home. However, the public does not go to the site. There's no um, retail. retail, there's no daycare, there's nothing where we would need to make a provision for lighting, parking, uh, noise, uh, entrance, exit, those kinds of things. Um, and so no permit would be required in that instance. A home business, however, could be where um, you are conducting a business of commercial nature on your home. You may have employees that come. You may have the, the public that would come, uh, much like a retail store or a daycare or um, something just where the public would be invited. So we made that clarification and that would be required to have an IUP. Interviews for me, mm -hmm. yeah. Any questions? That has the potential of having a negative impact to the to clear to, so. to just clarify on that, accountant working at their house, they have a partner, somebody come over to their house. If they have employees outside of immediate family members, yes, that would require an IUP. Okay, and that's the find in there? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the definitions, we're not going to go through each definition unless somebody has a question, um, but we did have a list here of definitions that were removed. We have definitions that were added, and then we have definitions that were edited. Unless you'd like to go piece by piece. Word by word. I don't have a question on them. Okay. Going through all the definitions is one of the places where I took a nap. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I have I have done that before myself. So, twenty five pages or something like that. So at this point, my understanding is that we are going to change the bluff definition to a fifty foot segment and not a ten foot. That's one. Um, I think at this point we're probably going to leave the uh, retaining wall as is, and then you guys can decide at that point if you want to, what you want to exempt and what you don't, because I think that's probably going to be a longer discussion than, than this, I think. I'm, I, but... My only opinion on that would be that if we modify the verbiage in there to remove anything in regards to the engineer acknowledgement, signing off on it, that there's something in there for hold harmless to the city of Nisswa for approving a permit contractors construct it if it's the boulder definition from a uh anything in regards to the material yeah and when, something for a hold harmless to the city and when they when they sign off on a permit you've, we've got some you've already got those exclusions in your permit right now so i mean that that say you know this is your you know i mean you've already got those hold harmless already when you sign up when you when you agree to get a permit for the city Fair enough. It's, yeah, much i think like it's kind of i think it's covered. failed we wouldn't be held liable no, I think you've got that covered. So sure. it's just a matter of if you feel comfortable, you know, saying that's an exempt activity. And I'm not opposed to it because I don't know enough about boulder walls. All I know is that my folks have one at their place and it's stood since 1998 and hasn't had a rock rolled on it. So and my dad built it himself. So I'm assuming it worked and he knows he's doing so. But doesn't it kind of get covered where it says that you have to have it signed off by an engineer? And if we have, if you're having problems and you wouldn't sign off on it, it kind of gets covered there, doesn't it? But then they're not going to be able to construct it unless the engineer signs off on it. Right. So and what we're what we're finding is that engineers won't sign off right. on a rock wall. They just won't. Right. Yep. So then then they need to engineer it out of something else. Yeah. Yeah, unless it's a cousin. At this point. Yes. Yes. And that's still a lot. 
Yep. yep. The four foot boulder wall was allowed as the current yep. ordinance is read today. Sorry, a four foot high would still be allowed because you don't require engineer signatures. Correct. Yep. Anything yep. above that would require unless you stepped it back, you know, and, and say you built us, you know, and you know, did the tiering of it. So then that would never be that wouldn't require engineering either. So so it's a legal document that the city attorney is going to ask them to sign. But probably. it probably requires more conversation than this because then you have your active load for sure behind the wall. What's your step back? Is it two to one? Yep. You're stepping it back yep. before you get out of it. And valid point. I so totally get I'm it. I'm just saying it it's probably a bigger issue than the people yep. in this room realize and more discussion. I so, don't think we're gonna solve it tonight. No. I totally agree right. with you. hundred percent. Right. Yeah. And then was there anything? Else that needed to uh, more specifically defined the uh, dirt. Oh yeah, moving, that's right. Dirt moving fill and the yep. requirements pertaining to that. Yeah, I can. I, it, it'll just be a just be a short sentence to basically this. The sentence will state that you know any activity of 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 you know dirt moving, including these, is considered under the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Just going back real quick to the previous pavers. Yes. And if you have a maintenance, you have to put a maintenance agreement in place. Mm -hmm. How does that transfer to new ownership? Or whose responsibility is it? That's a good question um, because it, you know, it's not something that's that's tied to the deed. It's not something that is, you know, that right. is something that you would record on the deed. It it's definitely could be something you require to cover that. That's that's a great question. Is how does that go from the next property? I know I worked at the county for about ten years. We ended up with three people that actually used that as an actual provision, just because it's not e it's not easy to you. I mean, you really have to stay on top of it and. Because the minute you don't, you know, it said by January 1, you had to have your, you know, your basically your port county saying that it's been maintained. And if it's, and if it's not, then at that point, it technically would become, you know, an impervious because it hasn't been certified that it is functioning the way it was designed. So it, it's not like you're going to see a whole lot of people, you know, using it. And, right. I just. Yeah, but it's, it's a valid point. I mean, that could be something to think about. It. You might want to, if you're going to use that, yeah. you need to record that on the deed so that the subsequent, uh, on a title search, if come across that there's a, another piece of this that you need to be aware of. Yeah. In the same spirit, we have the same issue with um, shoreline buffers and a sure. requirement for a shoreline buffer. Absolutely. If property Maybe gets so. sold, um, you yeah. know, what prevents yeah. the next person to come in and mow it all down? So, oh, that just um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. No, the things we're all working on trying to figure out a way to, and it's not just the city of Nisswa. I know other places are working on how, how do you, how do you manage that? And how do you do that? That kind of made me think that of any additional maintenance for any other particulars within the ordinance to then maybe categorize them together, that properties that one's purchasing at a certain time, this needs to be considered. Um, right. Just so it's then passed on. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. that. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Is there any other comments from the from you guys up front? I know you've spent some time looking it over and have kind of put up with me for a few months going through the process. Is there anything else that you would want to, you know, is there something in the ordinance that doesn't sit right or you want to talk about it more or are we pretty comfortable with where we're at today with where it sits? I don't have anything else. No, I, I don't have anything else. I just... My main comment in this is that it's uh, this is going to make life a whole lot simpler for our planning staff and for the for the developers and the builder when they come in because the answers are going to be there now, which is they had an awful lot of interpretation before this and right. Um, I, I think this whole thing has really come together. And I wouldn't and, don't ever think that when you do this revision that you're done. Because you know you're going to come up with some you know I, I we've came in today and did them over the last six months we've made a machete because I've been working with you guys since like June I think we've taken a machete and a, I mean we've whacked we now we kind of finally see the you know we kind of see where we're going a little bit and we got things cleaned up and the framework is there but now you can come back and later with just a little bit more of that fine tooth and just a little you know making mm -hmm. changes here and there when when Bethany identifies just a few tweaks that need to make sure for clarification. I think the framework is there and I think you guys can take it now going forward as far as what you think you want to do for you know modifications because we see today any questions come up and what about this? We went, never thought about boulder walls. I, that never even occurred to me. So it's you get great feedback from the public and your stakeholders and you want to be responsive. And so a good ordinance, it gets reviewed and changes get made to it uh, to make sure that it's current with the what's happening out there um, in the real world of building. 
Is there anybody else in the room that has any last comments? Anybody that's been sitting through this? Okay. So from a procedural standpoint, um, I'm going to go back and I'll make the changes that you've given me tonight and I will send Bethany a brand new copy. And I think you're done with me at that point. I think I've accomplished what you've asked me to do and um, it's been a pleasure. It truly has. I've enjoyed it. It's been fun. Uh, I've learned a lot myself going through this process too a little bit. So it's been good for me. I appreciate the opportunity and um, you got good staff. You know, well, you've got good staff, and I think you guys are set up um, to go forward now and to really um, do a good job balancing the private owners and, you know, property rights versus, you know, keeping in protection of the awesome resources that Nisswa is known for. I mean, you look at the map, there's just, there's just water everywhere, right? And that's why people are here. And I think well, you've, you've made some good choices, and I'm, I'm very happy to be part of it, and I appreciate it. So thank you very much. It's always nice thank working you. with professionals that have a high degree of expertness and, and show it. You know, you know. When you find a professional, let me know, because yeah. I'm just doing the best. <laughs> well, we're working on it. We're working on it. So. It's been a pleasure. If there's anything I can do down the road, um, don't hesitate to give me a call, and we can definitely talk about some other ideas if you have some things that you think I could lend my help with. Well, we yeah. thank you in the city of Nisswa. Yeah, thank you too. very much. Yeah, appreciate so it. procedurally, we're looking at a February meeting of taking one no, last look at this and then then uh -huh. recommending it to the to council or, or not recommending it at that yeah, point. But we'll prepare all the here. changes. We'll hold it here. Um it'll be at the planning commission meeting at the regular scheduled meeting. Um and we will um vote to uh, or you'll um just either uh, recommend approval or recommend denial. So the, so the mm -hmm. council will get it in February hopefully. That is the hope. Yes. yes. I would recommend when I get you the copy tonight to some of the DNR as soon as you can. Okay. And let them know that because they're going to need their time to digest it all and give you some feedback. And you deal with it in 30 days. So the DNR does. I hope they get this tonight. So that tomorrow you can just. If you can get. Okay. I'll call you. Yeah. Okay. So it could be March then. Yeah. Maybe none. You never know. It's got to line up. I got you. Gotta okay. Provide the notice. Cause you, you, I think it's what, 14 days. I think you need to provide notice for a public hearing and, and that kind okay. of thing. So. But the DNR, we said we give them 30 days notice to review the ordinance changes and stuff. So, and I'll I'll send them a copy of it too. Right? Okay. You know, so that they have that would be okay. Fine. On on behalf of our chair Josh Young, he also thanks you. Oh, so. I appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Well, we move on. Um, old business. Um, we're not aware of any at this point, unless somebody something new has happened. Um, city planners report. As you can see from the packet, the city planner report was pretty bare. Um, we're still looking for a planning commission member. Uh, we do have one vacancy, um, and we have approved one permit in the last month. So I do have one name that's going to come to light here in the next couple of months. Okay. This gentleman will be moving to Niswa, actually pretty close to here. He has expressed interest. Uh, I think it would be a good fit. So in probably a four to six month window, if there is still a vacancy, I know that he would be willing to put his name in the hat. That would be wonderful. I'll pass yeah. that along when the time comes. The way things have been going, more than likely the vacancy will be there. So <laughs> I hope not. Okay. Um, permits approved? Any, anything One special more. on permits? Sure. One permit. One yep. permit. Yep. Ah, things are slowing down. Four season porch. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a permit uh, to rebuild. Look for it. a motion to adjourn. So moved. Taylor, second. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed. Thank you, Gary.